Welcome to all of you on this day of days. As we know, it's not just getting toward the end of a semester, but um, I know we're all we're all preoccupied. And um, but I'm hoping this can be a moment to gather together um, as colleagues uh, that will just I don't know provide some kind of like respite or distraction or whatever you need um, today for your day. Um, this is the third of three fall events that David and I have run under the auspices of the Levin Institute and with the inspiration and blessing of Daniela, who had conceived of this program to begin with and gave us the means um, in the means to put it together and to run it. And um, we will soon be announcing a program of three events for the spring as well. So those of you who've joined us for summer all this semester, we hope that you come back um, and join us again for the spring. Um, our formats have been pretty standard across the board, but if you are joining us for the first time, we have um, four panelists today, all editors from different disciplines and types of publications. Um, and writers as well, who will be sharing with us their experiences of, quote, thinking like an editor. This time, the panel is going to be moderated and run by David Yulin, who's my co-convener, who is also a brilliant editor and writer himself. Um, so we have a, a great opportunity um, there. Um, any tech issues, it's fine. We'll roll with it. I think we are all pretty savvy at going with the flow at this point. Um, the one thing I would ask is that unless you're in a circumstance that renders having your camera on quite prohibitive, um, it would be nice to see as many actual faces as we can. Um, it just, I, I personally feel like seeing people today would be nice. Um, but again, Deborah, you're coming to us all the way from London. so. If your camera doesn't work, it's okay. <laughs> um, we're so glad. Oh, I'm so here. sorry, Emily. It was fine when we started. Oh, no, then... trust me, you you you're here, and I can feel that. So um, we'll we'll run the panel until about the top of the hour, and then we'll have 25 minutes or so for uh, for Q and A, and use the blue hand raise hand function for asking a question, and David or myself will moderate. So with, without further ado, um, oh, if you haven't met me, I'm Emily Anderson. I'm in the English department. I will now turn it over to my colleague, David. <laughs> Thanks, Emily. Um, thank you all for coming. Thanks to the panelists. I'm gonna suggest you guys, you all can do what, what you want, but I'm gonna suggest going to speaker view once the panel gets started, just so that the, you know, whoever it is who's speaking will be front and center. Um, I'm just gonna talk about a second or two, well, probably more than that, just to kind of lay the, the what we have done, if you've been here before, has the first two panels involved the speakers making a kind of statement um, about their feeling about the topic, and then um, and then we kind of moved into a moderated Q and A with the audience. This is going to be a more traditional type panel where we're all going to sort of talk together. I'll be the moderator and and toss out questions, and then as Emily said, uh, around one o'clock <clears throat> we'll go to um, questions from you. Please use the blue hand because there's a number of you here, so I can't manage all of those screens. Um, the other thing I just want to add is that um, if you want to see this again, or if there's stuff that you feel like you missed, um, we are going to be archiving these events on the Airlight site, which is the literary journal that the English department um, has started. Um, we're sort of waiting for a couple of details to get settled, and then we're going to actually archive them in order. So they'll, we'll start with the first event from September, and that'll be, that'll be posting fairly fairly soon and um, and the others will be posting kind of subsequently. So um, so that's that. I'm gonna turn on speaker view um, and I am gonna just do a quick intro of the panelists in the most abbreviated way and then we'll jump right into the conversation. So today's discussion is called The Shape of Writing, Thinking Like an Editor. Um, it's the third in the fall series of three um, events about um, the shape of writing. Um, the panelists include um, Sewell Chan, the editorial page editor of the Los Angeles Times, Deborah Friedel, an editor at the London Review of Books, Kim Robinson, the editorial director of the University of California Press, and Tracy Sherrod, the editorial director of Amistad, which is an imprint of HarperCollins. 
Um, and we're going to um, sort of talk generally about kind of what their work involves, but also um, what they're looking for, you know, how, how they work with writers, um, brass tack stuff as well as aesthetic stuff. I'm always kind of interested in both the practicalities and the, um, and the more sort of esoteric stuff. So, um, <clears throat> so with, that, with that being said, let's get started. Thanks to the panelists for coming. I'm going to start by just sort of going down the line, and I think we'll we'll start we'll do it in the order in which the um, in which the introductions were done. So I'll start um, with Sewell, and then we'll move um, to Deborah, and then to Kim, and then um, to Tracy. Um, and I guess I just want to start by let's let's start with you know I would say um, what's a typical day on your job, but one of the great things about all of these jobs is I don't believe there are typical days. So um, so let's start with sort of like what you do and how you do it, or maybe how do you do what you do? Sewell, you've been an editor for a long time in a variety of capacities at you know New York Times and um, now at the LA Times. Um, so what how do you define your job? What do we what what would we need to know about uh, about your work? Well, David, as a journalist, I've alternated between being a specialist and being a generalist. There have been times where I've had a specific beat to cover, an area of expertise, a domain of knowledge to try to understand, a set of sources to try to understand. More often, in my, as a writer especially, more often as an editor, I've been that generalist mode where I'm trying to like read, read everything, which is, of course, impossible because like it's just, ours is an age of a tsunami of information, though not necessarily, sadly, a tsunami of insight and thoughtful information. But I try to read very, very widely, and I'm always trying to think a little bit ahead of the curve, which is, again, really, really difficult. Thankfully, I have a wonderful team that's also working on it, to think about what are the most important uh, takes that, um, that, is, that are important for our audience. And I think one thing, one key way we think about edit, think we, to think of as an editor in 2020 is to really think about who your audience is. So the call that I just got off of, uh, uh, hour long debate, we, we really talked about, look, Los Angeles Times, we made all these liberal endorsements. We supported the proposition on uh, affirmative action, which failed. Uh, we opposed the Prop 22 Uber and Lyft on, on economic justice grounds. Uh, that proposition succeeded. Um, uh, uh, we obviously endorsed Trump very early on, the largest of it, the earliest of any national newspaper. Uh, you, mean, you mean Biden? You mean Biden? Oh, sorry, endorsed Biden, of course. <laughs> it's been a long twenty. It's been a long twenty-four hours, and uh, and of course the margin was much much thinner than uh, than anyone uh, uh, on the Democratic side would have hoped. So what I was trying to do just now in the last hour is explain to tell my team, really work with my team, explain to Californians. You know, and California is also incredibly diverse. A lot of Trump voters live in this state, though obviously as a proportion of the whole, not very large. But really try to explain for our audience why, you know, things that are taken for granted on the coast or in huge cities like Los Angeles are not necessarily taken for granted elsewhere. To also, I also have a writer going deeper on, on you know, what we're learning from the polling about the Latino vote. Obviously, had very heterogeneous. Again, one th something that you try to do as an editor sometimes is challenge the thinking. What does the term Latino mean? Does someone who's indigenous and Central American have anything in common with someone who's white and Cuban? Uh, or someone from the Rio Grande Valley or someone who's Puerto Rican in New York? And again, these are themselves categories that need to be um, uh, challenged, right? We're, we're complex. And sometimes I think the social science, the data is all trying to like put us in the categories and groups. But we all know that actually human psychology, human emotion, human cognition, human reaction are pretty hard things to um, uh, to fully explain, which is why you know half of us are in therapy. Um, so I guess part of it is I would say you know my day involves understanding what our audience needs to know and understanding the kind of framing for opinion arguments that would most make sense for our audience to but both stay on top of the news but also like rubrics for thinking about the world and how to like process this deluge of information that we're going through. Um, that, that's the most important part of my day. The mechanics are talking to my writers, talking to potential guest contributors, looking for perspectives that might be surprising or unexpected. One final example, and then I'll shut up. I was on a panel two nights ago with a guy named Stuart Stevens. He used to be a Mitt Romney advisor. He has since become a never Trumper Project Lincoln person. He wrote a book called It Was All a Lie basically saying the Republican Party has been grounded in racism. Very interesting. The book's getting a lot of attention. He predicted like a total repudiation of Trump. Well, obviously that has not happened. And so I, we're going back to him and saying, hey, you know, I was talking with you 36 hours ago via Zoom and you were like, this country's about to completely reject Trump and the Republicans will fall apart. And I'm not seeing that right now. 
and he was a Republican for 30 years. So, you know, again, looking for like Pete, the right, the match of the writer, the idea and the moment is a big part of, of my day. Great, okay, um, thank you. Uh, Deborah. can you um, follow that up with sort of that, that same kind of general question discussion? You know, what's, what's your day look like? What are you looking for? Oh, yes, the, it, it's always wonderful to, to see Sewell um, and awful to follow him um, on a panel. Um, <laughs> So I, I work for the London Review of Books, um, which comes out um, every two weeks, or they, they call it here a fortnightly. Um, and it's sometimes a, a difficult magazine to characterize. Um, you know, it's not quite a newspaper, it's not an academic journal, um, but both academics and journalists you know, write for us, um, usually writing in a way that they're not quite used to. Um, you know, in, in their daily life. And part of, I think, being an editor at the LRB is working with someone, you know, who's an expert, you know, in her field, um, but maybe isn't quite used to translating that expertise, you know, for the general reader, um, for the common reader. And, you know, really what we do, and I, I've been at the LRB now for 15 years, um, is, you know, we, we just rely on our, our sort of bag of tricks. Um, they don't always work but usually um, to, to try to help people, uh, you know, say something interesting, something worthwhile um, to a readership that, you know, maybe they, they didn't quite realize that they could speak to. Um, and some of it, you know, really it's, you could almost make a computer program for some of what we do, that it's something we do. Um, you know, I would say, Often the biggest thing I'll do as an editor for an, an academic for the LRB is I'll just persuade them to cut their first paragraph. I think when a lot of academics write for the LRB, the first paragraph is um, you know, throat clearing and introduction um, that actually can go. And the second paragraph is where it gets exciting or you know, I'll help them cut their last paragraph that's in conclusion comma that you know, we don't need. Um, some of it though can, can be more interesting. Um, Mark Reif, who's an editor at the magazine M Plus One, wrote an article a few years ago, um, I think for the Chronicle of Higher Education, where he said that often when he had an essay by an academic and it didn't quite work, the reason was because the academic was just dumbing down. Um, and what he, he realized over time was you need to get someone to be writing as well as they can, as intelligently as they can, um, for someone who just you know, doesn't have the same body of reference, doesn't have the same vocabulary. Um, what we do at the LRB, frankly, is usually what we do is, you know, if someone's written three books on Chaucer and the Canterbury Tales, we don't ask them to review the next biography of Chaucer. Um, and th there's certainly exceptions to this. Um, but what we found is actually, if, if, you, if you're the expert in your field and you've been thinking about it for 20 years, it's, um, it's very, very rare that you're going to be able to do a 2,000, 4,000 word version um, of what matters most to you. But what we might do is say, ooh, you know, you've been, you're the Milton expert. Um, I'm not gonna give you a Milton biography, but have you ever just written about, you know, there's a novel set during the English Civil War. You know, why don't you try writing on that um, and see where it takes you? Or, you know, in talking to an academic, realizing that they had an interest, you know, from graduate school that they haven't been able to follow up. And, and the reason we do this is because when you're writing an essay, you have for us, it's so important and so difficult um, to remember sort of what you didn't know when you started researching um, so that it stays interesting, stays fresh. And then part of our job as an editor is just to help you fill in those places where it's, ooh, you know, a reader doesn't know X, you know, put this in, or actually here you're over explaining, you know, we get the point. So I, I hope that answers some of your question. Oh, it does. And it raises some really interesting points that I just want to kind of mention specifically because they're, they're things I hope we all can talk about. One is, I think, this notion of writing what you don't know or writing um, from your question, I guess, rather than writing from, not to say not writing from your expertise, but writing to discover and to explore 
um, a question or assignment, which is something that you know I think about a lot in terms of um, writing essays. And also the kind of notion of trusting your reader and trusting your audience, which I think is really important. I'm curious, I, I mean, I'll, I'll kind of ask, I'll, I'll ask this as we move through the panel, but I'm curious about that sense of, of trusting your audience or trusting the intelligence of, of the readership, um, trusting the readership to go with you, and also the notion of a kind of trusting your own sense of intuition in terms of, um, of whether, whether to make an assignment or as we move into the book editor territory, whether to, um, whether to pursue publication of, uh, of a particular title. I'm very interested in the kind of um, the intangible aspects, let's say, of, of editing and of the editor writer reader, I can't even speak, the editor writer reader triad, which I think is, you know, I do think of as a kind of triangulated um, uh, unit. So, um, Kim, I'm going to move over to you and sort of ask you to kind of talk about this from the perspective of, of book publishing. University of California Press is a major university press, but also, and publishing academic books, but also um, has a major trade, um, has a major trade effort. And, um, and you have kind of worked in a variety of, of, of jobs at UC Press. Um, and so I'm kind of curious about Again, what is it? What does it look like from the inside? What are you all looking for? And you know, and definitely this question of sort of audience trust and into and sort of trusting your own in, intuition or your instincts. Yeah, I um, I have moved into different roles, and I was struck by what Sewell said when he said he became more of a generalist as he became an editor, and that's definitely true. As I've moved into the editorial director role. Um, which is a great fit for me because I think of myself as a mile wide and an inch deep. Um, and so I get to love all of my disciplines equally. Um, so a little bit about how we work and what we do. I just came out of our weekly publication meeting where we review proposed projects to consider for contract. And one of the key questions that we're asking is really does it fit the UC press list, um, which does differ from other university presses and other presses. And I would say, I would characterize what we consider UC Press book to be a little bit more narrative uh, over theory. There are presses that really emphasize theory, especially academic presses, and we really care about storytelling and um, projects that are interdisciplinary. Uh, so that struggle with the core issues that we care about as a press that are across discipline and that where the solutions are gonna come from across disciplines. So the environment, race, gender, inequality, poverty. Um, and we tend to partner with uh, activist scholars. Sometimes we publish activists, sometimes we publish um, journalists, but often, and often we publish scholars, but all of them have an activist bent or um, they tend to be the authors that we partner with most successfully. Um, and we're explicitly progressive. Um, so on a morning like this one, <laughs> I actually feel reassured by what we publish day in and day out because books are a long game. They take a long time to conceive and research and write. So we can't react to the news. Um, but when you know George Floyd was murdered a few months ago, we had already published crucial books on Black Lives Matter, on the Black Panther Party, books by social justice leaders like Grace Lee Boggs. Um, and then leading up to this election with all of the polls that didn't tell us anything, we just published a book by a scholar at American University about polling failures in US presidential elections. So that wasn't an article that he wrote today, but something he'd been working on for a long time. So I like to say that people, what's gratifying about working for university press is that we're gonna publish it regardless of whether there's an obvious market for it. And then when the world suddenly knows they need it, we're providing it. So um, that doesn't get much into the editorial relationship with authors, but maybe I'll leave it there for now. Okay, and I'm gonna, I wanna follow, just quickly follow up with that sense of, of not publishing it explicitly for commercial reasons. How long do you, in terms of keeping books in print or letting books go out of print, what's the, what's the press policy on? I mean, how long are you willing to let a book uh, wait to find its audience? Well, printing technology has changed. We can basically keep any print book in print for as long as it can. We're bringing actually the entire backlist into print because of new technology. So print on demand technology has allowed us to bring thousands of books that were out of print back into print and provide ebook versions of those which haven't been, which does increase discoverability, which is fantastic. Um, the only books that tend to go out of print these days are fine arts books because of the rights issues around uh, illustrations and paintings. Great. 
Okay, thanks so much. Um, Tracy, I want to turn to you now. You're, um, you're, you're directing Amistad, which is in, you know, in imprint, um, you know, at, at HarperCollins. So one, you know, a, a kind of um, an imprint of one of the big five. Um, and I'm curious about that. I'm also curious about kind of your, your um, you know, you're a, a leading African-American editor publisher in an industry that has not been um, particularly progressive on, um, in, in many ways, and in a lot of ways, certainly in terms of diversity and inclusiveness. So I'm curious about both, you know, your sense of that, but also kind of, again, what you're looking for, how your vision um, for the imprint um, fits into the larger kind of, um, I guess, corporate imprint of HarperCollins and, um, and, you know, and, and anything else about the, the aesthetics or process of, of the work that you um, want to share. Oh, okay. Um, thank you, David. You know, um, on Monday, in between meetings, uh, I had opened up a manuscript that had come on submission and I got really lost in it. And you know, when you get lost in it, it's like nothing else exists. You're like suspended in time and you're like, oh yes, oh yes, this is so good. And, and then of course the computer starts going crazy with all those dings because you have some meeting or some Zoom thing you have to do next and, and you know, but it's those moments where I'm suspended you know, where the voice has carried me away, where I can feel their point of view coming across, you know, in the early pages, you know, the early words of it. And, and just feeling that, you know, there's going to be a market for this today, tomorrow, and three and four and 10 and 20, you know, years from now. And so that's what I'm always looking for in the material that we publish. And, um, and we've been fortunate, you know, to, you know, to publish some great things as a result. Um, but it was difficult to just have, you know, that maybe 20 minutes with those pages and then to fight the rest of the day to get back to those pages. Cause you know, earlier when um, Sewell was telling us about um, his day and the meeting he just came from and Kim, the meeting you had just come from. And it made my head go backwards and like, what have I done today? You know, and then it, it's like, you know, the day started with the meeting with legal, started with the meeting with marketing, started with uh, the next with a meeting with marketing and the author, you know, so all of those things. And then, you know, running the PL for finance and talking about a book and the possibility of buying that book that I read on Monday and, and all of those things. And so, um, so there's a lot going on in the day, but the interaction that I've had today with an author was a new author I signed up to go over her outline before she starts her book. And then another one to discuss blurbs and then another to say, where's her editorial note? And so it's on its way. So hopefully tonight I can get that done. And so, um, and so Amistad is multicultural and we've published, um, well, we're African-American and we publish um, Pulitzer Prize winner, Edward P. Jones, Jacqueline Woodson, National Book Award winner. Um, we're gonna be publishing Paul Beatty, the man Booker Prize winner. And then we also published Steve Harvey and we're publishing Cicely Tyson and Mary J. Blige. So we have a broad range and, and I love that about Amistad and it being at HarperCollins. And I believe that we strongly complement the publishing program at HarperCollins because Harper does. Um, Harper was Zora Neale Hurston's original publisher. It was Martin Luther King's original publisher. And, um, and the list goes on and on and on. So while there are lots of struggles around diversity in book publishing, um, I believe that Harper has a long history in publishing diverse voices. And so I think it's wonderful that Amistad is situated with, with HarperCollins. Me too. Um, all right, so let's let's jump into some um, some broader questions. I'm, and this can anyone can kind of 
can feel this that they want. One of the things I'm struck by, and it's true of my own sort of editing life as well, but in listening to um, to the four of you is the kind of balance between, let's say, love or like something that just grabs you, a piece of writing or a writer or an idea that you're, you know, you just have to have, and practicality, let's say, which is not to say that love is impractical, but in my experience, it's often is. Um, so, you know, that that the 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 balance between the piece, let's say, in terms of the periodical editors or the book or the manuscript that you think is just phenomenal, um, but you're not quite sure how it fits or whether you can fit it in. Um, and also your own practical sense, whether that has to do with the economics of publishing or the kind of the shape of a section or the shape of a page and the other pieces on the page, what's happening um, in current events uh, for, you know, in terms of op-ed pieces or, you know, what's coming out. How do you all balance that? Because we all as editors have, have to pass on work that really moves us um, at various points because we just can't figure out a way to make it work. That's one of the most tragic parts of the job, I think. How do you all, how do you all balance that? How does that affect the kind of um, your work and the kind of decisions um, you're making? And I kind of, I mean, I can call on anybody, but if anyone wants to just jump in, I think that would be the, that would be ideal. Okay. Oh, okay. Great, Tracy. Tracy. You know, um, you know that's part of the reason why we have our commercial publishing program, of say a Steve Harvey or a Mary J. Blige, so that we can publish also the things that we believe will will change the world, the precious um, literature, and um, and so we we still do it, but we just don't pay a lot of money for it, a huge advance for it. And then really, you know, fight for it along the way. Cause usually things that are precious, you know, will need a lot more attention marketing wise and, and a lot more love. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's right. um, Kim, in terms of, in terms of um, the UC press program, I, 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 I'm, I'm making an assumption here. The econo I'm assuming the economic pressures are um, are there, but also different in some in some way because of the variety of things that are happening. Um, and well, I don't know. You tell me. What what's the how does that work in terms of what you're doing at UC Press? Yeah, we do have to be financially uh, self supporting. Uh, the university doesn't give us a lot of uh, love. <laughs> we have to kind of go out on our own and make it work. Um, but we do have an economic model that's based on most of our, most of our authors having a job and their, their job is being a professor. So they have a salary and their publication works into their promotion. So they have another uh, incentive for getting published uh, that isn't just an economic one um, or the economics work in a more complicated way. So we, you know, we do, uh, have a variety of what we call product types. And so if it's scholars really talking to other scholars, that's one track that it goes on. If it's scholars talking to a variety of scholars and a niche outside audience, that's another track. And then if we have a real crossover potential book, that's another track. And that does help to balance out the economics of the whole program. And I should say, as a you know, from a writer's point of view, as a writer who has made a career kind of really seeking out the low advance, you do end up crossing into royalties faster. <laughs> <So> <laughs> yes, you win in the long run. <laughs> so that's what they say. Um, all right. In terms of in terms of <laughs> in terms of writing for for magazines uh, for magazine a magazine like um, like LRB, Deborah, can you talk a little bit about you know in terms you were talking a bit about kind of who you'd assign or who who wouldn't, but obviously not every idea you get paid, even ideas you like, some of them fit, some of them don't. Um, can we talk a little bit about kind of how an issue gets put together and that notion of, let's say the collage of the issue, you know, you, you need pieces that are kind of, you know, either are in conversation with each other or kind of rubbing, el banging elbows against each other. There's a, there's a back and forth, not just within each individual piece, but in the, all of the pieces that make up an issue. So I'm curious if we can talk a little bit about how an issue gets put together. I'm muted. There. You're good. Sure. Um, well, one of the luxuries of working for the LRB is that um, if you've ever looked through an issue and tried to figure out the publication dates um, of the books under review, you, you'll realize um, just how liberal we can be. Um, we do sometimes uh, cheat a little. Sometimes it seems as though a book has just been published and you realize that it's paperback publication details at the very top. And what this means, um, though it can tortures our writers, is that we often have um, a very big box of pieces waiting to run 
you know, essays that we consider evergreen, um, you know, a piece about new translations of the Odyssey, you know, can wait a year, two years. We've had pieces run three years after they've been given to us um, so that we can also have pieces in the new issue as we will that, you know, um, come in, you know, just a few hours before we go to press. Um, so, you know, at, you know, about an election, um, for example, um, because it's true. I mean, one of the things we, we pride ourselves on with every issue is that, you know, there will be a balance of pieces. Um, do you accept those pieces that you hold on to? Do you accept them or, I mean, do you accept them and then tell the writer that they're, that you're going to be, you know, that they are kind of in that evergreen territory or how do you negotiate with a, um, let's say, how do you deal with an impatient writer who would be, might be delighted to have a piece in LRB, but might not be so thrilled about having to wait a long time for it to appear? Sure. Um, I, I worry that writers sometimes think we're being disingenuous and we're not. The truth is we put every issue together, you know, almost at the last minute. I mean, I really don't know often which pieces are going to run right away or in a few weeks um, and which ones will wait around for a while. Um, Often it has to do with length. In general, shorter pieces, you know, might be able to slip in sooner. Um, not always. Um, and so I, I feel terrible often because I think people think I'm making it up when I say I really don't know when your piece is going to run. Um, sometimes writers get tortured the other way where, um, you know, they send in a piece, they expect to wait a while, maybe it's their fourth or fifth piece for us, they think it'll be a few months and it's, nope, um, you have questions from the fact checker today, I need to turn around by Friday. And it's because, you know, this is your moment, you know, we need, you know, you somehow balance out the issue. Um, not always just in terms of subject, though often it's that, um, but it, it might be in terms of tone. Um, it might be, you know, the, the essay form, what, one of the things I love about it at the LRB is, is how elastic it is. So some of the pieces for us um, are, are really quite personal, more essayistic. Um, some are more academic, almost you know, closer to what you might read in like the Times Literary Supplement. So part of what you're doing when you put an issue together is, is also balancing you know, pieces in terms of style. Um, so yeah, I mean, what to say? I mean, our, our, our writers have learned to be very forgiving. Um, Sometimes people have been caught out, like they're, they're on vacation and you know, don't have all the books they need for fact checking or you know, they're on a cruise ship with no internet and you know, we make demands. So, so sadly, people have to sort of be always on from the moment we, we take their piece. Right. Yeah, no, it's interesting too. I mean, I'm, I've also had this experience as I'm sure you've had with writers where you know, a piece sits for four months or five months and then all of a sudden it, it, it's not even that you need it right away once it gets turned in but it gets turned in it sits for a while and then all of a sudden it fits an issue and then you've got to go from zero to 600 you know in the, uh, at the turn of a dime and just be ready to, to revise and, and fact check and things like that. Um, Sewell in terms of putting you know I, it's a, a similar question for you I mean the turnaround is, is quicker you know I, as uh, you know as an example if we if we can last night for instance when um, things were uncertain and working out in ways that hadn't been anticipated. What, you know, you've got to put a page out every day. Um, so I wonder if you can take us a little bit through the process of putting out today's page and what it, you know, how, what, what, how it shifted, what it looked like when it finally closed. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, you know, uh, the one thing with when you're doing a print publication is there is a hard deadline. So there's yeah. a lot of contingency planning involved. I'm very struck by the temporal variety of the editors here because Kim, Tracy, obviously working on book length works, Deborah, very long form essays, you know, we're, we get hundreds of op-ed submissions a week and I'm actually looking for, for, and we're understaffed and looking for ways for us to better amplify the voices of Californians and California based scholars. So, you know, the plan for last night, I mean, we basically had at least three uh, editorials prepared, one for a decisive Biden victory, one Trump and one, uh, the one we ended up running, not surprisingly, without a clear outcome. And then we had kind of a second round of pieces ready to go uh, uh, this morning, and some of them were launched. And looking at the op-ed page, yeah, it's stuff that we kind of all knew we could run without having a clear outcome. Um, I think the opinion cycle, the, the cycle for kind of opinion journalism has unfortunately accelerated and often become as 
quick as that of the news cycle. But opinion journalism, even on a daily basis, is still different in, separate, in several respects. We're really relying on expertise. Um, I think um, we're not like op-eds pay, what, a couple hundred dollars, obviously not going to be part of someone's income, but op-eds and, and Sunday opinion pieces in a newspaper can help, you know, build a scholar's reputation and also kind of selectively intervene in a conversation. You know, um, um, uh, David, ask me, am I address getting to the heart of what you're asking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, can I ask you just to not to distract you, but when you say um, selectively intervene in a conversation, can you be a bit more specific about how that yeah, works? Yeah, 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 sure. Um, you know, um, I've worked a lot with scholars in the past. I think um, I see what Deborah's saying. So I want to give a few pieces, just very tangible advice. A question I get all the time is, how long should an op-ed be? Like, you know, if you go to the web page, it says 700 to 1,000. But realistically, most people are not actually great at writing 700 to 1,000 that an editor will want. So I usually recommend writing long, and I usually recommend, you know, making your argument complete. Because if we're if we're grabbed, I mean, as Tracy says, if you know the first paragraph grabs us, if the idea is there, believe me, we'll suck out those words. With, uh, with a surgical scalpel. I mean, in fact, nothing is really more fun and fulfilling than sucking out unnecessary words. You know, Maxwell Perkins was famous for that, right? That you'd hand him something and then it gets back to, the, the happiest, you know, one of the happiest things is when you turn a manuscript back to someone and they're like, nothing changed and yet it got 20% shorter and the argument got sharper and we're like, yep, thank you. <laughs> and we love doing that. So, you know, when I say a, an intervention, I mean, you know, look, not every, everyone's area of specialty, especially if you're um, knowledge creators, like all of you are, it, it's only going to run into current events occasionally. So, you, so what you're trying to do is really find that moment or what that opportunity when what you're studying really meets the moment. If I can give probably the most extreme example, this is a really extreme example. When the night that Osama bin Laden's uh, death was announced by President uh, Obama, um, we, we, we got a few hours advance notice from the White House before the president's announcement. So we sprang into action. We commissioned like the FBI agent who interrogated KSM. We got the former CIA director who had warned Bush hours before about, you know, terror attack imminent. That stuff we got underway. The most interesting thing that we got over the transom was from a scholar of Islamic law and practice who in particular had focused on maritime burials during the golden age of Islam. So she was very well positioned to talk about the implications of bin Laden's burial at sea. And it was like, I don't know how often she's gonna write about this, but it was her moment. It was an absolutely brilliant op-ed and it was just kind of like the right moment. And I think that, you know, scholars should take, you know, the, the risk of just saying, of saying, hey, would you be interested in this? You know, what I have to do intersects with this current moment in these ways. And they're not often expected ways. So let me ask you, and, and then Deborah, I want you to answer. I want to ask you the same question too. How much do you, um, how much do you buy over the trans? I mean, how much, you know, how much, unsolicited work ends up actually either getting into the paper or the website, as opposed to work by columnists or contributors or the work that you and your editors are going out to solicit in response to a particular um, situation. So Sewell, that's for you to start and then um, and then I'll, I'll move it over to Deborah. Um, uh, the, the unsolicited part, we take unsolicited submissions really seriously and we get hundreds a week we have someone practically full-time assigned to read the so-called slush. Mm -hmm. That was the case of the New York Times as well. I think unsolicited, you know, being open is really important because as much as we try to look at book catalogs and academic catalogs and browse bestseller lists, the fact is that like our commissioning alone isn't gonna cover like the vast domains of knowledge that you all represent. And also more importantly, I think that there needs to be a democratic aspect to publications. You know, LRB, NYRB might be a little, just because they're, they're longer, I won't, I won't speak for them, but they might be a little bit more commission based, but especially for kind of a newspaper and a general opinion section like ours, it's really important for us that we continue to be completely open to pitches from all sides. What, I, what we don't like are pitches where it's just like, are you interested in this topic? Well, yeah, we're all interested in the topic. But what's the argument? So you don't necessarily need to send a complete draft, but you do need to send your argument, your angle, your take, how your expertise might be brought to bear on a question that's that's that people are engaging with right now. And then you have to stick with that pitch, right? You know, I mean, you can't pitch a piece and then turn in a completely different piece, right? You gotta you gotta stick with the argument you've you've decided you want to frame. Um, Deborah, what, how does it work for uh, for you in terms of, of that question, in terms of either you know soliciting work or work that's coming in over the transom, um, work that you're not expecting? I mean, you know, how, how what's the balance um, for for you? 
Uh, sure. So most of the pieces, um, overwhelmingly, um, are things that we've commissioned. Um, however, let's say, you know, we, we do have a, a slot in the yes, um, in every issue called diary, which is first person personal. Um, and I would say at least a few of those a year um, are things that have, have just come to us, you know, completely, completely done and we've edited. Um, the problem is, you know, if people send us um, a long already written essay book review is even if I think it's fantastic, there's a decent chance I've already commissioned someone else to review the same book. Um, so, I mean, the best that could come out of that is I'll go, ooh, this is really good. I'm going to ask the writer to, you know, to write about something else, um, but not you know, publish that particular piece. Um, pitches, however, we're extremely open to um, and we're, we're grateful for really because, you know, we, you know, one of my editors like to say that, you know, we're, we're a train that has to leave on time with every seat full. I mean, if you get a pitch that, you know, someone has identified an interesting book um, that's going, you know, they realize that there's something that's going to be published, you know, in six months, they've done the work of going, you know, through publishers catalogs and identified, you know, something that looks appealing. Um, they've explained why, you know, they're the right person to speak to it. They've given you, you know, it can, just a few sentences, you know, not necessarily more, um, a sense of you know, what they want to say about it. We're, we're very open um, as you know, but I, as I always, as I tell people, as I tell friends, um, we have a very high kill rate. Um, and one of the, the great luxuries of working at the LRB um, is that we you know, are able to you know, pay people well for work that we, we're not able to publish. It often finds a home somewhere else because often the work is, is really good. Um, it just, it wasn't right for us um, for reasons that were often terrible at, at articulating. Um, the work, if it finds a, a home in a more academic journal, that sort of explains why it wasn't for us. Um, sometimes it finds a home in, you know, a news, newspaper op-ed page, you know, also wasn't quite for us, the, you know, something worth publishing. I think this, I mean, I think this is a really important point about, I, I'm actually curious, one slight, just a, a slight follow-up, what is your kill rate, just so people can know in terms of how, in terms of what you're, what you're soliciting and getting and, and accepting, or, you know, re, I guess accepting how much is actually ending up in the journal and, or in the magazine and how much is, um, is being killed? Mm, so it, it varies a little, and sometimes it's negotiated differently, depending on the writer. Um, I think standard for the industry is, you know, we pay about, I think it's usually a third of what we would pay had we published the piece. Some people, sometimes people do quite well. They take our kill fee and then they get paid again mm -hmm. um, you know, when it's published by another publication. Um, in, all right, so Tracy, in terms of publish, in terms of book publishing, obviously, again, it's different. You're not getting, I mean, maybe you are getting stuff over the transom, but I'm assuming 99.9% .9 of the submissions that you're getting are, um, are agented. Um, when you get a submission for a book, <clears throat> I mean, I, and I, I'm assuming it's also, I shouldn't assume, but I'm assuming it's different for fiction and nonfiction. Can you kind of take us through the process of what you're generally getting, who you're getting it from, whether directly from writers or agents and what it kind of looks like in terms of um, fiction you're publishing as well as um, nonfiction. For fiction, for instance, do you need a full manuscript? Would you be willing or able to look at a partial manuscript with a synopsis for nonfiction? Um, again, I'm assuming probably proposal with sample chapters, but what, what is the, what's that process look like for you? Um, we do get a lot of material um, unsolicited. I would say about 25% um, actually. Um, and unsolicited in the sense that it's addressed to me, you know, not, and, it, and it's not from an agent, it's from the writer directly. And so lots of um, writers will send an email and you know, and then, you know, it's just a Gmail account. So it's naturally, you know, them. So, so I get quite a bit of that. Um, I actually do look at it and, and consider, but very quickly, I, I can't spend a lot of time. I look very quickly. Um, Cause sometimes, you know, people just don't know the proper route and they actually have great credentials for what they want to work on. So, so yeah, I always skim and, 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 and give, you know, a, a real open mind though. I'm skimming, but it's a very, very open mind. 
I have um, acquired like say maybe a hundred books since I've been at, at Harper and um, and maybe three I acquired were unsolicited. And so, so it, it, it does happen. And um, so for novels, I prefer, if you haven't published a book before, I prefer that the novel is complete. Um, if you, but um, if you haven't published a novel before, I, I prefer that it's complete. But, you know, but novels have been acquired on partials, mm -hmm. you know, from someone who hasn't written a full novel before, but we're very skeptical of that because you never know what can happen. Um, and so, and then for nonfiction, I um, definitely a proposal, you know, upfront your credentials um, and then what the idea is because your credentials matter more than almost the idea. Mm -hmm. And then, um, but I'm not going to have credentials stop me from taking a look at what the idea is. And most of those things are from agents. And, um, and so what's, what's new lately is rather than a proposal that looks in your traditional way with a marketing section, you know, um, sample chapters, all those things the agents are having the, the authors write a letter to the editors. Now this letter could be 20 pages long, 50 pages long, but you know, it's telling you about the idea and telling you about themselves and it's all interwoven together. Mm -hmm. And so that's been the new thing by the, the people who are, seem to be getting the highest of advances these days. And then, so, so, but I prefer, you know, what the idea is, it doesn't need to be lengthy and extensive and it should be re highly readable because it's very difficult to like chug through something, you know, when you're trying to write in a certain way that may impress, you know, your colleagues down the hall, but wouldn't impress like say a high school student. And it's really important to impress that high school level student, no matter what you're, you're expressing, because that, that means you have lots of sales potential. Yeah, and also that's the reader, that's the next generation of readers. Um, I'm curious too, yeah, exactly. if, in terms of, in terms of you know, your own outreach, like are you as an editor, you know, if you see something, if you see a piece by some writer, an essay or a you know, piece of reporting in a magazine or, or, you know, or, or short or piece of fiction or something, are you, um, how much outreach do you make as, as not just you as an editor, but um, as, a, as an imprint in terms of um, work that you see out in the world and then kind of looking to see if that writer has more or if that piece can be developed into something bigger? Um, is that, how much does that factor in as, as part of your process? About five times a year mm -hmm. where I actually, you know, I have a list at the beginning of every year of some people I want to go after um, from some things I've seen written or, or, or whatever. And so for me to finally get the time to actually write the letter to them, you know, because I, I think it must be you, you should really express how you feel about what you read and what it means to you and how you see it as a book rather than, you know, you know, a quickie, which some people do, which is, you know, oh, are you interested in writing a book? Oh, let me know. And that, you know, that kind of, you know, approach. So, so I, I take my time and I think about it and turn it over in my mind many different ways, because I want to make sure that, you know, I have a clear vision so that when I go to them, it's something that they see the same way that I do and can execute because there's a little bit of danger there. If you come with an idea and then you, they deliver something completely different and you, and you have gone out after them. So that could be tricky. And so, yeah, so I, I really like to make sure we're on the same page and are, are very clear in, in all of our upfront communication. Great, thank you. And I always recommend they get an agent, you know, they don't have one already. 
yeah, I think that's a, I, I, I think I always, I recommend that too, or I would recommend that too, just because they don't, that, that way they don't have to get involved in the, in the, the business side of the relationship. They can let the agent handle that and also have someone look out for them on the contract side. Does Kim as an academic publisher agree with that advice? Just curious. Yeah. It doesn't make a lot of sense for academics who, um, the finances aren't that complicated, but for trade authors, we work with a lot of agents and I do, I mean, they're, they're, it's the same pool of academics, but those who are writing for a larger audience, I think it's, it is nice to be able to separate that financial conversation with an author from the business conversation, um, especially if you're trying to negotiate down and so you've been telling them how important they are to you and then you're telling them they're not that important to you. <laughs> so, um, Right. You're, they're important, but they're just, you don't want to pay. They're not, they're not, they're, they're not worth that. Your, their importance isn't worth as much as they might think. It yeah. Is. It's nice to have those conversations separate. But Kim, I want to also turn and this. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Was that Tracy? Was that you? Um, yes. I was going to ask him a quick question, which is, do you find that your pool of, of authors that is getting more competitive to hold on to them, to find yeah. them? Because yeah. aren't trade yeah. publishers kind of. Yeah, we launch a lot of careers and it's really frustrating. And so we're delighted. We had a, an author, Jason DeLeon, who wrote an amazing book about um, uh, migrants crossing through the desert and how that was a government policy set out to actually execute them essentially. And then he just sold his second book for six figures <laughs> to a trade house and we can't compete with that. So. We, we were delighted that his career is taking off, but we're a little heartbroken that he didn't stick with us. And that happens to us again and again and again. Yeah. So, so let's, so let me ask you, Kim, in terms of, of, of how those, how those books, I mean, again, I'm assuming a lot of stuff is coming in over the uh, either agented or otherwise, but you know, uh, over the transom unsolicited, let's say. Um, but there is also that, um, that sense of kind of the, pre the press reaching out or the press kind of building a book with a writer or with, with some, can, we, can you talk about that process? I guess how it's similar in some way to um, a, 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 an, a solely trade house, but also I'm assuming different in terms of the um, requirements of the academic press. Yeah, I think we do a lot of listening and it's easy for the editors who have a specific field that they're working in. They, they become part of an external community that's really um, as rich for them as their colleagues. They go to academic conferences, they read journals, they're reading the, you know, op-eds or other things that scholars might be writing. And they're really in communication with that community and doing a lot of listening about who's the next rising star who should I look out for? So the submissions don't necessarily um, come over the transom, but come through those really deep networks that they build in their fields. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, no, I think it does. I wanna to touch on one thing for all, for everybody, one more question, and then I wanna turn it over to questions from the audience. But I'm curious, Sewell kind of touched on this a little bit when he was talking about, you know, right long, we like to, we like to vacuum out the words. Um, and I'm curious about what the work process is like. Again, obviously every writer editor work process is different. Every writer, writer editor um, relationship is its own thing. But generally speaking, I'm curious what, you know, what the work process is from your point of view, um, you know, as a kind of general rule. And Kim, I'm gonna start with you because you're on my screen. <laughs> how, how does it, how does it once, once you have the manuscript, how does it operate? Well, you know, for me, it operates depending on the audience. You know, if it's really scholars speaking to other scholars, I, do, I rely on the peer review process for a lot of the feedback. And I don't do a lot of editing of those manuscripts. They're, um, they're effective for the audience that they're trying to reach. Um, and so I invest time more depending on the potential size of the audience. And so often it'll be you know, looking at the intro and one chapter and saying, do what I did here through the rest, rather than actually reading every page of the manuscript. And I mean, I might read every page of it, but I won't necessarily give feedback on every page of it. And um, we also pair up authors with develop professional developmental editors rather than our acquisitions editors doing that because it is a, a special skill set, and um, that can be really, uh, fruitful, especially for academics who are trying to reach a larger audience. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Tracy, I want to ask you the same question about how, you know, th that kind of one to one work that you're doing with uh, with a writer, obviously, again, depending on the writer and the book, it's different. But generally speaking, um, I, you know, how collaborative is that process and how um, how well, how collaborative and maybe how complicated? Oh, it's it's extremely collaborative. Um, I envy Kim who, who could have a developmental editor and then acquisitional editors. Oh my gosh, we're doing it all. And so it's rare, um, but it's, 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 a, I recommend it in some cases. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, I think you heard the answer to my prayers. I think you stated. So, um, it's very, a very intimate relationship. And I've, and, um, of late, I have even decided to get more involved earlier. Um, and so, like I said, um, like I mentioned a little earlier today, um, during this talk, I was giving an author feedback on the outline before they've actually started writing the book. And so, so it's very involved. A lot of writers will deliver um, chapters along the way. And so I'll give them feedback on that. Um, um, and then some people wait until, you know, their due date and then they turn in the whole thing, mm -hmm. but they usually talk to me along the way and say, you know, I've been discovering this, it's moving in that direction, you know, and then if there's an author I haven't heard from, then I just start calling on the regular because something, they're not working, Some, <laughs> something's not right. So I need to call them, I need to check in. And, and make sure that they're not stuck. You know, sometimes you can have a whole bunch of words on the page and then all of a sudden you're like, where's the structure? What do I do here? And so uh, when they're quiet, usually something like that's going on or, mm -hmm. and so I'll reach out and then we talk it through. And so, and then once the manuscript comes in, there's um, line edits and an editorial note. And then, then hopefully it comes back and it's good to go. <laughs> yeah, that is, that's the hope, yeah. Um, Deborah, for you, uh, in terms of, you know, just in terms of, you know, since you're operating on pitches um, uh, on occasion or on more than occasion, what's that, what's the process from once you say to a writer, okay, we're accepting your pitch, um, go ahead and write the piece um, to the piece being finished and ready to go. How does that process look? I mean, you, you know, I'm sure every editor's had writers go AWOL on them. Um, uh, you know, so that may be part of it, but what, what's, the, what's the movement from, the, from acceptance to publication? Oh dear, you know, it, it varies um, so dramatically that I'm actually wary of, of generalizing. If, um, I'll, I'll do my best to sort of give sort of an example. Um, I mean, a lot of editors think that, I mean, the most important step is, is setting up the assignment and that if you get that right, you know, what follows, you know, sort of, um, more or less inevitable. I, I'm not sure that's true, but I, I know that um, like Sam Tannenhaus, the, the old editor at the New York Times Book Review, you know, said it was like arranging, you know, a very important romantic date, you know, having a sense of, you know, what writer would be able to speak to what book. Um, and it's true. I mean, sometimes you, you just get it absolutely wrong, you know, a good writer and an interesting book and, you know, they go past each other. Um, but if, let's see, to, to follow your question, sort of say, say it works out and you get a piece that, you know, you know is ultimately publishable. You know, it, it varies. Um, a lot of magazines, you know, have different styles when it comes to editing. Um, you know, I, I got my start at a magazine called The New Republic, um, which when I wrote for it was, was a weekly and cared, you know, it also published like the LRB, long essays, long book reviews, often by the same people who also, you know, appear in the LRB or appear in the New York Review, um, but they really cared mostly about argument. And an editor would work with a writer, you know, really to, to help you win. I mean, almost like a debate team. Um, even, you know, with a novel review, it would be, ooh, you know, I know you don't really like this novel, but the quotes aren't quite doing it. You know, let's find worse quotes. Um, the LRB isn't quite like that. Um, I mean, often we, we really don't even do very much with structure. I mean, we might even it out a little, if it's a chronological structure, you know, move things around a little, but we tend, um, ooh, I mean, again, this varies, but um, mostly to be helping people with, with style, mm -hmm. um, rewriting. Um, I, I think we have a reputation possibly for 
being more heavy handed um, than other publications, um, which some, some writers are, you know, if they like the style of the LRB, the reason they want to write for it is because, you know, they want to be an LRB writer and they're happy to go with it, um, can work out. Other writers realize that, ooh, actually, you know, they don't like it when we cut their jokes or make them sound like us um, and that they'd rather write for someone else next time. Um, ooh, I'm trying to think, yeah, just because it's, like I said, it, you know, each piece really is a, its own journey. Yeah. Um, different things happen um, in fact checking. I mean, that's where, you know, sometimes it's been a very light edit and a, a sort of smooth ride. And then the fact checker realizes that actually that there's a big problem with the piece. And at the last minute, um, you really have to help the, the writer to, to fix what went wrong. Yeah, no, I thought that makes a lot of sense. Sewell, I want to just um, end this part of the, we're going to go to questions from the audience. I want to end with you on this same subject, because often, as we talked about at the beginning, you're working on incredibly quick turnaround. I mean, you might get a piece in that goes live, you know, gets edited and goes live on the web within a, within a couple of hours. So in terms of that speed of turnaround, um, what, you know, how does that, how does that necessity, I suppose, affect the kind of um, the individual edit process and the kind of relationship, editor writer relationship? Yeah, and to be clear, there's still some stuff that we published that's just based on the originality of the idea alone with, without respect to timeliness and some stuff that we publish that's just beautiful because of its narrative craft and quality and, and we shouldn't ignore that. But for kind of the most traditional kind of op-eds, I think I'm looking first of all for logic and originality of argument. If, if it's clear that major, you know, that the major ob obvious objections are not, are at least not even addressed, that's a really fatal flaw. If it's clear that the argument is very obvious and doesn't challenge conventional wisdom anyway, that's a fatal flaw. I would say the logic and argumentation are even more important than structure because restructuring is easy, removing words is relatively easy, but the kind of the quality of the idea, that's often the hardest part. I also wanna be honest about something. I think that Americans, I, I, it's hard to generalize, but I'm thinking a lot about actually the, you know, Americans are finding it harder to talk to ourselves and harder to debate with each other. Um, I'm not at all saying, I'm not at all subscribing to right-wing people who say, you know, academia is becoming closed-minded. I don't, I, that's all bullshit. But, but I do think that in general, um, as, you know, as we've gotten more specialized, but sadly also more tribalized, it is harder to kind of cut through and just kind of understand the immediate objections that someone else might be bringing, whether those are ideological or just, or just questions of curiosity. So, you know, my job, like so, that of so many editors is to be the kind of, educated, I mean, like generally educated, open-minded lay reader who doesn't have that much subject matter expertise, but is coming in good faith and with an open mind. What I fear is that the number of such readers, let alone editors, you know, might be declining. And that's the subject for a much bigger conversation. But I think what is the, what, what can I say to you all as a group of scholars is always be thinking about, you know, how would I explain this back home? How would I explain this to people I went to high school with? You know, whether you're studying, I don't know, you know, colonial India or, or modern Hungary, you have to just find a way to explain how does this matter? What is the significance? What is, you know, what would a general person want to know and why would they find it interesting? And the thing is, it's, it's such an obvious question, but sometimes people don't ask it. But it is important to think about, you know, when you go home for Thanksgiving, how do you talk about the work you do? Oftentimes that vocabulary might help guide how you approach writing for a general op-ed audience. That's an excellent point and a great place for us to sort of wind down this part of the conversation. Um, so we are going to go to questions from all of you. If you can use the blue hand, because I won't be able to see you otherwise, um, please feel free to jump in and, um, and ask whatever question you have to ask. Um, if there are no questions, I'll vamp a little bit, but let's, um, let's see what, let's see, but don't, don't be shy, feel free. Uh, Sephora, I'm gonna, do I have to unmute you? I think I do, I can't. So you'll have to unmute yourself and then um, ask your question. Hi, yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I wanted to, to ask, I think, Probably uh, Kim would be the uh, question. Uh, my, my question would be directed to you. Um, that if you're um, an independent scholar 
uh, how does that, um, do you consider manuscripts from independent scholars who are working on particular areas or is it only um, people who are uh, in academia? But you have an academic topic, obviously. We do um, consider proposals from independent scholars, especially because of the way the adjunctification of the academy we see a lot more people uh, working independently. And so we do consider that. Um, depending on the audience for the book, we would still want that person to be involved with writing for the right journals or attending the right conferences if it's an academic book. And then again, to their involvement with the audience, depending how broad that the topic is. Right, and, and sort of a follow up on that, um, at what stage uh, is it good to send a proposal out to uh, the presses? Do you have, should you have a few uh, chapters in hand or should it be all complete or should it be um, beforehand an outline? Yeah, for typically for first books from um, academic authors, we prefer the whole manuscript because it has to go out for peer review and we'd rather peer review it once. Um, if it's a more experienced author who has already published a book, we're willing to look at a proposal and a couple of sample chapters. Thank you. Uh, Teddy Lance, you have your hand up. Hi, yeah, um, I just had a question, I guess, mainly for Kim, but I think it applies to um, uh, others on the panel as well. Um, I was just wondering, um, do you employ other tactics of reaching out um, for um, soliciting, com um, I guess, commissioned work from uh, scholars or writers? Um, or do you know of that sort of practice um, uh, in publishing landscape? I'm just thinking because I, I'm, I received an, a strange email that I've kind of forgotten about actually um, from, a, from a publisher of a kind of smaller press that I, I wasn't familiar with um, saying, suggesting that I pitch uh, my dissertation as a book proposal. And I, I thought, well, that's, that's kind of strange. I mean, I haven't published anything. I, you know, uh, so I'm just wondering in a kind of like, perhaps selfish way, just uh, how, it, how often does that occur? Um, and is it a, uh, is it a practice that you, um, anyone, you know, of a serious sort of publication employs? Um, it, I, I should mention, I guess, more specifically to the panel as a whole, it's, um, it's, it seems slightly auto-generated. Like it takes language from my profile about what the dissertation is, but it also matches it with a sort of personalized thing. So yeah, I'm just curious if you guys use such sort of like internet trolling uh, sort of uh, devices to um, solicit publications ever. We definitely don't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, but there are commercial publishers, even in the academic realm, that do. And I'm, I'm more familiar with them trolling for journal article submissions, and um, but not so much for book manuscripts. So that does sound a little bit unusual, and I'm not familiar with that. Um, you know, uh, journals that are just getting started or don't have much of a reputation are really trying to generate content. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of undifferentiated in its uh, quality or it's just it's just quantity thereafter. Um, but we reach out to people all the time. And um, if it's someone you've never heard of, I would be pretty suspicious. We tend to reach out to people who kind of know what we do and we know yeah. we, operate, they, we operate in their field and they're usually interested to talk to us. So um, yeah, I would be suspicious. <laughs> Thank you. Well, this raises a question I want to ask. Um, you know, actually, Tracy sort of addressed this um, earlier, but in, but um, but um, Deborah and Sewell, I'm curious from both of you in terms of we were talking about stuff coming in over the transom and finding new voices that way. But how much do you, or how much, or and how do you do uh, that kind of work of looking for other voices, whether not necessarily even looking for a specific voice to address a specific topic, but just um, in terms of that general kind of editorial outreach to keep the section. Um, or the magazine fresh and, and, you know, and have new voices cycling in and out of it. How does, how do you, uh, how much of that do you do and how, how do you do that? The truth is we should be doing a lot more. Um, the truth is that it takes the most time. And sometimes that's why we're more likely to rely on, re on writers we already know. And we know that that's a problem because we all only know who we know. 
Um, so, you know, when I, I mean, right now I'm more like kind of supervising the line editors, but when I was really a line story editor myself, one of the things I did a lot, I, I would look up conference catalogs. I would look up book catalogs. You see press, Chicago, uh, California press as well, Chicago press, definitely, because, you know, you publish great writers. Um, and um, I'm going to check out Amistad's, you know, catalog as well. Uh, a lot of that's online now, a lot of e-galleys, you know, that when I was an op editor in a previous job at the New York Times, that's really what I spent a lot of time doing. Um, looking through, you know, what's new, what's popping. Uh, because, you know, frankly, writing is an ecosystem, right? I mean, Kim and Tracy are looking for books that meet the moment with writers who deserve promotion. Um, we definitely hear a lot from book publicists. But, uh, but the truth is, you know, the work, especially when it comes to diversifying, because I mean, I'm going to reveal a hard truth, but something like 60% of the op-eds we publish are from male writers. We've, we've done tallies. Something like 85% of the submissions come from male writers. Um, it's, it's a very, very hard truth. Um, I, men are more likely to just think that what pops into their head is worth uh, sharing with the wide world. Um, women, even when they have, you know, postdocs and five years of ethnographic, ethnographic field work behind them are like, oh, am I, am, I, am I sure that, you know, I'm not sure I have something to say that the public would be interested in. I'm generalizing here, but there's some truth to the generality. And I know that for us to, as editors and as stewards of our publications to try to resist that, um, it's going to take a lot of work and, and we're not nearly um, good enough at it and, uh, and we're not well resourced enough, but that's not an excuse. We've got to do better. Um, Deborah, I wonder if you can touch on the same question just a little bit and then we'll go back to the questions from the audience. Uh, I, I loved Sewell's answer. Um, I mean, I, I, think, I think everything Sewell said could you know, equally apply to the LRB, um, perhaps even more so because as a British publication, um, we're also dealing with some class problems um, in England where, I mean, overwhelmingly, the people who pitch to us uh, tend to be posh, um, white men who teach at Oxford and Cambridge. Um, and I do think the LRB has gotten better. I mean, if you look at sort of the sort of younger writers coming up, they're you know, much more diverse um, than older writers. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's something, you know, all the time I think we need to be doing is, um, you know, reaching out to people who aren't pitching to us, even though they should be. Thank you. Uh, Sarika, you have your hand up. Thank you. Um, thanks very much to everyone. Um, this is really, really enlightening. Um, I have a question for Tracy Sherrod, if I may. Um, and it's about pitching a trade book in the next, well, say in two months time at this most volatile kind of moment of, um, um, of time. Um, so I, I have a book out and go to if you have any advice for authors who, you know, always need to kind of think about tweaking a proposal for the moment when it's actually going to land on editor's desk at a moment when everything is volatile anyway. I mean, one needs to, you, know, you sort of can't keep in touch with all of the news every day and actually finish your uh, materials. And maybe your book is not actually about 2020. I mean, it might be about 2000 years, not, not two years. Um, but I wonder if there are any kind of techniques for um, dealing with the kind of volatility when you, you still are going to be kind of handing, handing something over at a moment when the publishing world itself may not know what it thinks should be its priorities. Thank you. Oh, well, actually, you know, COVID and the pandemic has not really stopped publishing, not commercial publishing. We're doing, you know, really well. Um, and we're glad for that, you know, but personally, you know, I had an author who like pitched a COVID book, like three weeks into into COVID, <laughs> and I was I, I was annoyed. <laughs> I was like, I don't want. I mean, who like once we get out of this, I don't think we're gonna want to read a thing about it, you know, until the next pandemic, and then we're gonna want to find out what we did, you know, during this one, and so. 
I don't think that you should attempt to, if I've heard your question correctly, um, I don't think that you should attempt to make something timely so much as timeless for us, you know. I don't even think, you know, and it's so difficult for us to publish a book like instantaneously for something that would apply now and things like that. So, you know, that is one complication we are having is with printers um, in the US and being able to actually print the books. And so, um, yeah. So did I hear your question correctly, Sarika? Um, yes, thank you. I, I think you even answered a, a, a better one. Um, so if you, your book is um, about a long period of time anyway, um, I guess it seems like there's no need to kind of feel that you also need to keep changing the final, you know, keep, yeah, no. if, if it's coming up to the present, but the present is changing every hour anyway, um, we should um, not even bother uh, with this. Yeah, you have to pick a stopping point in a, in a book such as that, because, <laughs> you know, because it's always going to be a new present, you know, and that stopping point should definitely help you make your major point of what you're trying to do with the overall narrative. That should, you know, help you select that stopping point. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, we have uh, Ramita. Hi, um, thank you everyone for your time. I'm actually an undergraduate at USC, so I was a little worried about asking a question that was too juvenile, but um, I just wanted to ask if anyone has advice for young writers who are trying to publish for the first time, because it seems like, you know, everyone is looking based on writers' prior experiences, writers' prior published pieces, and for someone who has zero, how do you start building that up? Anyone want to jump in on that? Good first, sort of good opening steps, um, first, first steps to getting published. Well, well, for Please, Tracy, go ahead. Okay, I'll, I'll just go quickly. For the trade market, it matters more the condition and quality of that proposal and your platform than it actually has to do with whether or not you've written a book before, because we're always looking for debut authors because we can fantasize and not have to really adhere to real numbers of sales. So, so we love a debut, it gives us an exciting moment in publishing. <laughs> Thank you. So did you wanna add something to that? Yeah, I mean, there haven't been many, but I, I have edited work. I'm sorry for the glare, by the way. I'm, there's natural light coming in here. Um, I have edited work by some teenagers, some high schoolers, some undergraduates. I would recommend that if you're trying to break into a general publication, um, and I really am inspired actually by Tracy's openness to new voices for, for book length stuff. But I would say, you know, we publish stuff that that's very closely observed. You know, um, one of the most overused adages, is, of course, is write what you know. And, and you know, there are limitations to that, um, uh, the usefulness or the applicability of that advice. But I think when you're starting out as a writer, it, it's actually really useful, you know, start small. Start with things where like, you know, the vividness of your impressions of your observations, of your perceptions are real. You know, I'm working with a very young journalist right now who's only a few years out of college and she's covering Georgia politics for us, but she grew up in Georgia. And I'm asking her, you know, don't make it only about you, but, but you know, you, you actually have lived there. Like you're gonna know things that someone like me doesn't know. You know, like bring in some of that context, bring in some of that, that you know, that descriptive detail, you know, and frankly, um, you know, I think it can help when scholars use journalistic techniques. I'm not talking about the, the, the bad journalistic techni techniques like our, like our penchant for oversimplification, but rather the good ones like, you know, the, you know, richness of description, richness of close observation. How did it feel? How did it, um, what was it like, um, you know, what was that experience like? That kind of richness, you know, that's something that often, you know, young, young or emerging uh, writers really, really actually have almost a unique access to, right? Because you haven't, you know, there's a plasticity. You're not, you're not fully, uh, you know, locked into what, you know, whatever, whether it's a silo, a, a silo discipline of knowledge or writing style yet. So experiment with that, uh, experiment and embrace that, that kind of um, malleability. 
And also, I would just add to that, be familiarize yourself with the publication or the press or whatever, whoever you're soliciting work to. Definitely, it, it's, it's also a kind of an old adage, but it's, it bears out. See what they're publishing, um, what it looks like, and whether what you, whether what you want to write fits into it, because it's um, the rare publication that will adapt its, um, its templates for a specific writer, or I guess maybe the rare writer who a publication will adapt its, its templates for. Um, we have a question in the chat. Um, from Hannah Mason. My question has some overlap with the previous panel discussion, but I wanted to ask this directly to editors. If I have an old paper, a draft or a dissertation that I want to rework for publication, what are the most important things for me to focus on before I send in a draft to a press? And what aspect can wait for a longer editorial process? And I, again, I throw that open to anyone who wants to jump in. What, In terms of reworking something, um, what's the most important thing for, for a writer to, to focus on just to make that initial submission, assuming that there is going to be some kind of editorial collaboration on the back end. Anyone want to take that one? Oh, oh dear, do, do you think this is for, for books or for, for essays? Um, let's talk both. Why don't we start? Why don't we start with essays and then maybe we can um, ask one of the book editors to address it in terms of books. Hmm. Um, so I, so as, as I said, I mean, we do have, there, there's a bit in the LRB that's, you know, called diary, that's sort of first person, personal, um, maybe not too different in some ways in structure from, you know, something you might be writing on, on your own, you know, as a sort of piece of memoir. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, I mean, just to, to speak specifically about the London Review of Books, um, my advice would be just to, you know, to look at a few issues of what we've published to, to get a sense of, you know, if you think it's, you know, sort of what we do or, you know, look at other magazines to try to figure out, you know, where it's close. And then truly, you know, um, it's okay just to, to send an email to an editor. Um, my, you know, just very practical advice is to try to get a, a particular name. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, the perfect person on staff, but they're more likely to, you know, take a look or forward it to a colleague. Um, you know, what's the worst they can say is no. Um, and definitely, I, I think this goes to what Sewell was saying before about, um, yeah, sort of who has more confidence in doing that than not. I mean, my first pieces that I published were for um, the online magazine Salon. I sent my freshman essays um, that I'd written in, you know, it was a class called English 120. And it was, it was almost similar to the sort of essays you do when you're getting into college. Um, it was an essay about getting head lice at summer camp. And they paid me $300. I was so happy. I was hooked. That's what I was going to do with my life. That's a great story. Yeah, I, I, I like that idea a lot. Um, either Kim or, or um, Tracy, in terms, of, in terms of book publication, how would, uh, do you have a, a, a response, a, an idea of um, what that might look like? And I can reiterate the question if you um, want. It's in terms of taking well, old work to rework for publication. Yeah, Tracy. I'll I'll talk a little bit of crazy talk, Kim, Put us, <laughs> to get us off the hook, right? So one of the things I think, um, right after the um, murder of George Floyd, there were a ton of submissions that came to editors written by Black people and people of color, like a ton. And it was a very competitive marketplace and everything. And so, and a lot of it you could tell had been around the block many times. So the number one thing I recommend is change the dates because all the dates were all just change the date, you know, and at least no one will spot you as quickly. So um, that's my comment. Make sure it's fresh. Don't, um, don't just dust it off and, and press send, like actually read through it and make sure all the, the information is up to date and, uh, and no one can tell that you'd written it years and years prior. Yeah. It's excellent. That's excellent. That's excellent. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kim, do you have anything you want to add or? Um... Well, I just wanted to add on the conversations about the previous question in this one, which is, um, I often say there's no such thing as the educated general reader. There isn't. There are people with really narrow sets of interests. And there are whole rich communities that are in dialogue about those interests. And there's whole sets of publications that address those interests. And so some of our more successful books are about opera. And 
that's a small community, but boy, are they passionate. So it's finding who you want to talk to and then finding the publications in the community that you want to be in conversation with. And I think that's one of the keys. And, and it doesn't have to be shooting for a salon or an LA Times. You may have a bigger platform with the audience you want to reach with a more specialized publication. That's a great point. And it's a perfect way for us to end. We're right at 1.30. I want to be cognizant of everyone's time. So I want to thank the panelists for a great conversation. I want to thank everybody for coming. I want to thank everybody on this Zoom call for giving me an hour and a half today to not think about the, 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 the thing that everybody is thinking about. Um, do we have, did we have closing business, um, Emily or yeah. Daniela? Do you want to, is there anything else, anything we need to address before we, um, we end the event? I was just gonna ask our participants again to stay tuned for our spring programming and just a huge thank you to Daniela for giving David and myself the opportunity to initiate this series. It's been such an inspiring um, series of talks for me. Each one has been the high point of every month and thank you to our four panelists. That was, that was amazing. I really enjoyed myself. And I, I second that. Thank you to everybody for coming. Thank you to the Levin Institute and, and Daniela for giving us the, the, the space and the opportunity. And everybody, take care of yourselves and, um, and hope. Let's see what happens. Wow. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Tracy. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Thanks so much. Oh, bye.